Hey, howdy guys, this is Dave, and we are plunging directly into an icy cold choose-your-own-adventure reading. Terror on the Titanic. This one doesn't have a number on it. It's made by the same company, but it appears that it's some sort of a new book series that has no numbers. And it even mentions the original concept by Edward Packard, who's done a lot of these books that we've been reading. And it kind of makes sense that they would do something like this, because the copyright is 1996, and they're saying it's an August 1997 book. So I'm thinking this may have been done with all that hype about the Titanic movie with Leonardo DiCaprio at the time. But that is no matter, really. This also has a glossary of ship terms, so there's that. I will say that this is one of the more recent books that I have read, and that was even like five years ago. And I can already tell you that this one has a little bit of a longer intro, kind of like that Viking Raiders, but I think it's actually relevant storyline, so. And with that being said, plug your nose, cause here we go. You stand on the deck of the RMS Titanic, the brand new White Star Ocean Liner. She's the biggest, most luxurious ship in the world, and she's on her first voyage across the ocean from Southampton, England to New York City. The date is April 10th, 1912. The ship has just pulled away from Southampton Quay and is moving into the Test River. A huge crowd walks along the quay, following the great ship's progress down the narrow river channel. The Titanic glides by the New York, a smaller ocean liner moored at the side of the river. You watch as the smaller ship is sucked toward the Titanic. Bang! 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 You hear several loud reports, like gunshots. Looking down, you see the ropes holding the moored ship arc high into the air. They must have snapped! The New York begins to swing away from her mooring directly toward the Titanic. You gasp and grasp the railing tightly, expecting at any minute to feel a shuddering impact. As you watch, the Titanic slows to a stop, and the bow of the New York swings past her port side. A collision is narrowly avoided. That was a close one, says a tall, gaunt man standing next to you. He has a pale, lined face with a thin, grim mouth. He speaks with a lilting Scottish accent. It's a bad way to begin a maiden voyage. A bad omen. Turn to page two. Bad omen? Pah! Says a middle-aged Englishman standing nearby. A watch chain hangs from the brocade waistcoat buttoned tightly around his stout middle. He sports great gray mutton chop whiskers. There's nothing to fear. The technical journals I've read say she's unsinkable. She's a wonder ship. Aye, sighs the tall man knowingly. She is indeed a wonderful ship. A mighty ship, but the ocean is mightier still. Many a mighty ship has kissed the bottom of the sea. With that, the man turns and walks slowly away. Don't listen to him, says the Englishman. This ship is beautifully engineered, I tell you. She can't sink. Go to the next page. She is big and beautiful, you say, glancing around admiringly. The Titanic is 900 feet long and has four huge funnels. Her hull is painted a shiny black, and her deck superstructure is white. Her yellow funnels with black tips rise 60 feet above her top deck. It does seem unbelievable that such a massive ship could sink to the bottom of the ocean. Still, the Scotsman's comment has chilled you. Oh, so you're an American, says the Englishman. He extends his hand. The name is Hardcastle. Are you on holiday in England? No, you say, shaking his hand. I've been in London for the past month, studying classical piano. Turn to page four. A classical pianist, eh? Says Hardcastle. So you've been in England alone then? No, my father is with me. He has an import-export business. He had to stay in London to meet a client. I'm returning to New York with his partner. Import-export business, you say? Would the name of your father's partner be Andrew Tempkin? Asks Hardcastle. You nod. Yes. I met the chap just before we boarded. He told me he bought himself a black Rolls Royce. Yes, it's on board. He's taking it back to New York, you say. You know, you should meet my son Jack, says Hardcastle. He's just your age, and a very agreeable lad. I'm sure the two of you will get along famously. 
go to the next page. Mr. Hardcastle's mention of Andrew gets you thinking about him and the gold Buddha statues that he and your father imported from Siam. The box containing the statues arrived at the office in London while your father was out, and Andrew refused to open it in your presence. He made you run out on an errand. When you came back, your father had returned, and he and Andrew were examining the two statues, each about a foot high. Your father was disappointed. The workmanship was poor. Worse, the statues weren't even solid gold, but made with lead, painted with a gold leaf. Your father was angry, and vowed he'd get even with the Siamese traitor who cheated him. Andrew supported your father, and agreed the traitor was a scoundrel, but something about his manner made you suspicious. In contrast to your father's genuine rage, Andrew's reaction seemed mild. You don't trust him, and you aren't happy to be sharing this transatlantic journey with him. Turn to page 11. Over the next few days, you and Jack Hardcastle explore the ship. It's like an immense fancy floating hotel. There's a Turkish bath, a swimming pool, a squash court, a gymnasium, a barber shop, a hospital, a post office, and several restaurants and cafes. Late Sunday evening, about 11.30, you and Jack are in the first class lounge on A deck. You've been there for a couple of hours playing cards. Abruptly, Jack puts his cards down. I'm bloody bored playing gin rummy. He folds his arms and looks disgruntled. Jack is bright and generally agreeable, but he's a little spoiled. Let's go on deck and see what's going on up forward, you suggest. You're getting bored playing cards in the lounge too. Same ocean up there that's back here, he says grumpily. Then how about the Marconi room, where the radio transmitter is, you ask. I know one of the men who operates the radio there. Wait till you see it. It's huge. Turn to page six. The Marconi room, the radio shack, is up forward on the port, or left, side of the ship. To get there, you walk along the deck, to the other end of the ship. You and Jack shiver in the Arctic air. Overhead, the night sky blazes with stars. Below, the ocean is glassy smooth. You're amazed at how calm the water is. There's not a ripple. Yesterday afternoon, Harold, one of the two radio operators, met you as he was leaving the shack. He invited you to drop by any time. Without knocking, you open the door and go in. Jack behind you. A hot smell of electrical insulation hangs in the air. A man is on duty, but it's not Harold. Mind if we watch a minute, you ask? The operator doesn't hear you, or if he does, he's too busy to reply. He's wearing earphones and staring intently at a stack of papers. A blue spark flashes between the contacts of the radio telegraph key he's tapping with his index finger. You're entranced by the rhythmic Morse code and the sparking light. The message sounds important, but you can't understand it. Jack does, though. You watch him concentrate on the pulsing beeps as you both stand nervously just inside the door. Go to the next page. Suddenly, an incoming signal blares from the headphones so loudly you can hear it across the room. The operator tears the headphones from his head and smacks the stack of paper. With an exasperated look, he wraps back a message. He spots you and says, Not now. Too busy. Later. Out. Please. You both nod and duck out the door. Jack grabs your arm. That was weird. Those were private messages he was sending, maybe to a land station for relaying. Messages like, meet you Wednesday noon at the Waldorf Astoria. Then a signal came in. He got flustered and told the guy to shut up and keep the air clear. Another ship must be nearby. What was the other ship saying, you ask? I couldn't get the first part. Something like stopped, surrounded by ice. Ice, icebergs, you say. Maybe we're coming into an ice field. Let's go on deck. We may be able to spot some. Icebergs? Who cares? I'd rather go visit my friend the Chief Baker, says Jack. He's baking bread right now for tomorrow. He'd give us a loaf. Think of it. Hot, fresh bread. Oh, come on. Be a good sport. Let's see if we can spot a few icebergs. Then we'll warm up at Baker's, you say. Jack reluctantly agrees. I'll get the binoculars and meet you on the promenade deck, you add. Turn to page 15. You zip down the stairs to the stateroom you're sharing with Andrew. 
It's on B deck, a couple of decks below the port side. As you reach your cabin door, you hear a loud voice inside. Save us there, I tell you. No one will think of a car's frame. The voices stop short as you knock a couple of times and enter. Andrew is talking to a dark-haired man. They both look at you sharply. Sorry, I just want to get these, you say. You grab the binoculars from the table and leave. As soon as you're outside, you grimace with disgust. The man is Oscar Kilpatrick, a friend of Andrew's. He got on the Titanic at Queenstown, Ireland on Thursday afternoon. You don't like him. When he boarded, he greeted Andrew, but ignored your offer to shake his hand. Turn to page 10. You're still angry about the brush off. That and the man's arrogant and patronizing manner. You don't trust him. Andrew makes you uneasy too. You don't understand why your father chose him as a partner. Sure, he's sharp in business, a real smooth operator, but that's the problem. He's a little too sharp. You stop walking and think, what's in the frame of Andrew's car? Safe from what? Andrew's rolls is in forward hold number two, way down on G-deck near the bow. You're headed that way. Okay, everyone, here we are with our first set of choices. If you postpone meeting Jack to explore Andrew's car, turn to page 64. If you go to meet Jack with the binoculars, turn to page 93. I am definitely curious about what's going on in Andrew's roles, but something tells me that he is equally as suspicious of me as I am of him. So I should not be going by myself into forward hold number two. So I think we're gonna continue forward and we're gonna meet Jack with the binoculars. Hopefully they give us a choice to go check that out together. I mean, who knows? But with that said, we're gonna turn to page 93. You decide to let the mystery in Andrew's car go for the moment. No one can leave the ship until she docks in New York in a couple of days, so it can wait. Jack is squatting behind the promenade deck railing where it curves around the forward section of the ship on the starboard side. You stand under the bridge with a clear view of the crow's nest and beyond it, the bow. You hand him the binoculars. It's beastly cold, he chatters after a couple of minutes. I can't see any more with these than I can without them. Just smooth black sea. I'm turning in. He hands the binoculars to you and leaves. For a couple of minutes, you sweep the horizon in front of the Titanic. Just as Jack said, there's nothing but darkness. The stars look brighter through the binoculars though. The great bronze capstans near the bow glint under the stars. You train your gaze on the two lookouts, more than 30 feet above you up in the crow's nest. Funny, they don't have binoculars. You sweep the horizon another time. You catch a point of light that shimmers faintly. It's duller than starlight. Maybe it's a reflection. Turn to page 115. You strain to see. Something massive, even darker than the sea, begins to fill your view. It's an iceberg. The light on top must be shiny ice reflecting the starlight. Wow, you mutter. The lookouts are staring right in its direction, but they can't see it without binoculars. You keep watching as the object gets bigger. Do you dare run up to the bridge where no passengers are allowed and warn the officer on duty? Or should you tip off the lookouts and let them deal with it? Maybe you should wait a little to make sure it's really an iceberg. Well, everyone, considering we're reading this over a hundred years later of when this happened, we definitely know it's an iceberg. So you know what? Let's call these lookout guys. Let's see what happens with these lookout guys. Cause that is the thing. They didn't have those binoculars. So maybe if someone with binoculars like us just warn them, you know, let's see what happens. I mean, either way, the ship's gonna sink, right? Page 105. Ahoy, crow's nest. You cry your loudest. You wonder if ahoy is the right word. You shout a couple of times. The rushing air muffles your voice. They can't hear you shouting from the promenade deck. You rush down two decks to get to the well deck and then run forward till you're almost under the crow's nest mast. But now the crow's nest is way above you. Iceberg! Iceberg! You scream up at them. At your shout, one lookout peers intently into the distance, then clangs the warning bell three times and speaks urgently into a telephone. It seems like an hour goes by. Nothing happens. You can't feel the slightest change in the rhythm of the Titanic's engines or sense the deck move under your feet the way it should when the ship changes course. 
And because you're down in the forward well deck area, with the forecastle blocking your view, you can't see the iceberg either. Just as you sense the turning of the bow under your feet, a shower of ice cascades over the starboard well deck rail. One of the huge pieces brushes you and slides with a thump into the stairway you just came down. Turn to page 63. The Titanic limps at half speed into New York, two days late. Damage below the starboard waterline has kept all her pumps working continuously. Hull plates on three of her forward watertight compartments are badly smashed by the brush with the iceberg. Your steward saves a great chunk of ice in the ship's refrigerator for you. You show it to the New York Times reporter after the Titanic docks. You and your ice end up in a front page picture. The end. Ladies and gentlemen, we just altered history. The Titanic did not sink, but in fact was only two days late. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just think that is, that is just so awesome that that's even a possibility. But anyways, that was kind of a short reading, so I think I'll do this one again, and maybe next time I think I'll go down and see what's going on with the rolls, you know? Nothing with that Andrew dude ever got cleared up. But all I know is that we are the ultimate shit, and nobody even had to die. And with that said, everybody, if you like what you heard here, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, have a good one.